Today, uh, we're oh. going to be starting a series on Ephesians, uh, which talks about God's plan for the church. Uh, Ephesians is God's plan for the church, much in the way that Romans uh, outlines a systematic plan for the theology of the Christian faith. And in the today, we're going to be in chapter one, where some foundations are laid for the work of God on earth in general. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start reading here. Uh, in the first chapter, it's uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. In other words, this was first directly written to Ephesus, but also to all the faithful in Christ Jesus. This was a book that was going to have broad applications throughout the history of the church. And it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So in starting verse 3, the, the, the part is, is that the Christian life is not about how do we get the blessings of God. We too often think about how do we get access to the blessings of God. But it begins with what God has already done. That's what makes Christianity different from the other religions, that what makes the gospel different. If you go into Islam, Buddhism, or even into the secular religions, all the other religions are about what man does to get to God, or what they may call God. But the faith that was once for all revealed to the saints begins with what God does. And that's properly so because God is the creator of the universe. He is the foundation of the universe. And in Colossians it says that in Christ, in Him, all things consist. So if God is the foundation of the universe, if God is the reference frame for the universe, then it follows that uh, any path to godly living should begin with what God does. And that posed a dilemma for us when Adam and Eve fell. Because God, God created us so that we could freely enter into that relationship. Where that begins with what God does. God moves in us so that we can will and do His good pleasure according to in, uh, Philippians. Uh, and so it goes on here, starting in verse 4, it gives us some very deep passages here. And I'm going to read 4 to 11 and unpack what the significance of what it, that means. It says, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purchased, purposed in Himself, that in a dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together into one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and in which are in earth and in Him. In Him we have also obtained inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted Christ should be to the praise of His glory. Now this whole passage is talking about predestination. In verse 4 and in verse 11, we, we, we see uh, predestined being used. And both times, that predestination is relevant to in Him. In verse 4 it says, uh, just as He chose us in Him, and then in verse 11 it says, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, according to the purpose of Him who works all things to the counsel of His will. Now let me ask you, what is the counsel of God's will? How does this predestination work? Uh, there is a school of thought called Calvinism, which basically argues that God predestines everyone and that there is no thought process 
involved that he simply arbitrarily picks you like you can go to a stack of pencils and you just pick one. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. The Bible teaches that predestination is relative to his foreknowledge. In Romans 8.29, it talks about those he called, he predestined, and those who he predestined that he foreknew. I've actually got that backwards. Uh, but it begins in that passage. You go to read in, in Romans 8.29. It begins with foreknowledge. God predestined those whom he foreknew. And here it says that he predestined those according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The counsel of his will is God's foreknowledge. That's how it comes and says that we were predestined, chosen in him. Because you see, God anticipated those who were going to be in him when he chose them. He knows everything you're going to do. He knows everything you might do. That's way beyond our ability to understand and plot. We make our decisions and we anticipate things in the future. We all do that, or at least I hope that we all do that. That when we go and we're faced with a decision, we think about what might be ahead. And as human beings, we do this imperfectly. We do this not really knowing the future. We just guess at what the future is. We, we know some things about the future. Our knowledge is very imperfect. And much of what we think we know, we guess about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but God also anticipates the future. However, He anticipates it with perfect knowledge. He knows who's going to trust Him. He knows the thing that will draw you to Him for those who come to Him. And in verse 13, it picks up this part of the, the narrative here. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the pur purchased possession, to the praise of His glory. This talks about what God actually did when, when He saved us. The things that He did in delivering of the gospel. Romans 10, it talks about blessed is He who shares the gospel peace. Uh, it says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But, but in order for the Word of God to be preached, somebody must be sent. And so... God in His predestination, God in His foreknowledge, God in working out His purposes, plan exactly how to draw you to Him. In my own personal life, when I was about your age, Mikey, I was a, a little bit younger, I was 12 years old, I was a bad boy. I was very naughty, I was very rebellious. Very rebellious. Wild, out of control, ran the streets. The Holy Spirit was working on me while I was 12 years old and I was doing all these things. I was taught better, but I did anyway. And I was getting this nagging thought that I wasn't going to make it. That when it was time for me to die, every once in a while this thought would come and think, am I going to make it to heaven or am I going to hell? So then one day I asked my mom that. I said, am I going to make it to heaven or am, I, or am I going to end up in hell for what I'm doing? And she did. She said what was nice to me rather than the truth. She told me only the really bad go to hell. And didn't tell me that according to the Bible we, we are all born sinners. In God's eyes we are, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so I was hellbound, but I was still nagged with that. Now, before that, we had, I had went to church 
in a Catholic church as a little boy. We lived out in Starlight, Indiana, and that's the only game in town as far as church goes. Everyone went to the Catholic church. Everyone that lived around there at that time was, were Catholics. But I was bored. It just struck, it was very religious, but it, I, I didn't feel the presence of God there. I hated to go to church. And I would tell my mom, I love God, but I hate church. And so all these years I had the idea that I hated church, but I love God. So then one day, a guy by the name of Calvin Paris, who uh, operates a bus ministry for Graceland Baptist Church, knocked on the door and invited me to church. This was back before they made church bus drivers get a commercial driver's license. When an operator, all you had to have was an operator's license to drive a church bus. Uh, so I said, why not? I can tell you right now, I have no earthly clue why I said that. Other than the Holy Spirit was working in me. So then I ride the church bus. I go to Graceland. It was uh, a James Robinson crusade that was being held uh, back in 1981. So I go up there. And I still remember this question. James Robinson asked, If you were to die tonight, are you for sure you would make it to heaven? And when he asked that question, I knew that my soul was headed straight for hell. I was convicted by the Holy Spirit that I needed a Savior. He didn't even tell me I was going to hell. The preacher didn't tell me I was going to hell. He wasn't doing hellfire and brimstone. He wasn't telling the audience they were going to hell. He was asking a question. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to people in the audience that if you were to die at that moment, you would not make it. That, that the, the supreme judge of the universe would have to reject you. I, at that moment, I knew that, that if I stood before God's judgment at that time, He would have rejected me and justly sentenced me to hell because of my sin. Because I was doing my own thing. Which we all start out life doing our own thing. And so needless to say, my attention was on the gospel. I didn't go down to the altar that day to get saved, but I came back. And I came back. And I heard the gospel. That I needed a Savior. That the blood of Jesus was my only hope. That Christ died so that I wouldn't have to spend eternity in hell. He shed His blood on the cross. And in Revelation 12, it talks about how we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. And in Colossians 2.15, that it takes away all Satan's power. We read throughout the Bible, the blood of Jesus takes away the power of our sins. It takes away the guilt of our sin. It helps us overcome the enemy. The blood of Jesus brings healing. We have all these blessings here. Purchased through the shed blood of Jesus. Did all these things that happened, did they just happen in my life? Did all these things that happened, was it a coincidence that James Robinson had a crusade that he asked the very question that was going to pierce through to my heart, that was going to cut through my mother's spin because she didn't want me to be burdened with the terror of the possibility that I, I might be in danger of hell? Because at that time she thought, uh, that she would be nice? Was that a coincidence? Or did, or is there an all-knowing Creator who loved me, who knew exactly how to cut through the spin to reach my soul? Let me testify to you, according to the Word of God, the God who works all things after the counsel of His will, there was a master plan to save Dallas Carter. And I am, my life is the blessing of that plan. God planned how to reach me. For everyone who gets saved, God has a plan to reach them. And so we have these blessings. We have this as a sure foundation. And this predestination is not just about who's going to get into heaven. 
versus who isn't. Because it's written in here, be predestined. And I'll go back to verse 4 here. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption of sons. So we're to be holy, well, without blame. And Romans 8.29 talks about being predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Because you see, those He foreknew, He predestined. Those whom He predestined, He called. Those whom He called, He sanctified. And those whom he sanctified, he glorified. And that's in Romans 8.29. In other words, predestination isn't just the ticket to heaven. It's about Christ being, according to Hebrews, the author and finisher of our faith. And in Romans, the first chapter talks about the faith that's from faith to faith. In other words, God is working in your life. From before the foundation of the earth. He started before time began. And it continues to work. All the way till we. Are raised from the dead. Perfected glorified in an eternal state with him. And everything in between. God is working. In the foundation. In the background. He's working in us. So that we can. Will and do his good pleasure. He does what we utterly cannot do for ourselves. And that which we do is possible because of what He is doing. What did Jesus say? He said, the Father works and I also work. And by that He meant that the works that He did, He did because the Father was working through Him. He works in us so that when we do what God has called us to do, that Christ is working through our work. And this is the foundation for what he wants to do in the church. And the first chapter ends here. We're going to talk in verse 15. It says, Therefore I also, having heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand and in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and mind and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What that means, folks, is that God wants to give us the spirit of revelation so that we can see what he is doing. That we not have as our frame of reference in life just our limited power. When we see the walls hem us in all around according to that song, that we not think that the walls are hem us in, that we not be like the unfaithful Israelite spies who said, they're giants and we're just a bunch of grasshoppers. The faith, the frame of reference of the faithless was, we can't do it. We don't have the power. The frame of reference of Joshua and Caleb was because they received the spirit of revelation. They didn't see the world through their powerlessness. They saw the world through the mighty power of God. They saw God's plan, how he brings things together. They knew that God was bringing things together and that in the right time they were to go in to take the land. They saw the miracles God did in the past. They saw an all-powerful creator leading the fire by day or the fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And so he prayed that they would have that spirit of revelation and, and that should be always our prayer. That we see things through his reference frame, through the mighty power of God and not through our own powerlessness. That the same God who was the fire 
by night, the pillar of cloud by day. The same God who performed mighty miracles to bring Israel out of Egypt. The same God who merely spoke the word. And the heavens were created. The earth was created. All the processes that went in. However long those processes took. It was at the word of God. It was at the creative power of God. That these things happened. And even, even secular physicists are acknowledging that. That 74% of the energy of the stuff of the universe, they call it dark energy. They don't know what it is. And it's some rather strange stuff that doesn't follow the laws of physics. And they believe that the universe is expanding because of this dark energy. And it, it expands. And the war, here's the thing. When something expands, if it's finite, you would think that its density would decrease. Density is mass divided by volume. But this dark energy its density stays the same. No matter how big the universe gets, it stays the same. That's some rather strange stuff. If it was a set amount of mass, then its density would get lower. So the total amount of dark energy is actually increasing. Which the physicists cannot explain. Bible explains it. It's God's... We call it dark energy. They call it that. It's not because it's dark. We can't see it. We can't observe it. But the scientists know that it's there because of its effects. That's just a fancy way of explaining it's the creative power of God, but scientists want to call it the creative power of God. Science is limited to observing the natural universe. But the same creator through his word spoke the heavens into existence. The same word keeps the heavens and the earth for judgment. Is that work in your life and our life? Bringing things together as a supreme architect, bringing all the pieces uh, of the architecture together so that at the right time, when he tells you to go, you go. When he tells you to do, you do, and he is there with you to give you the victory. And this sermon, this message is over with. But we're going to talk next week about how that applies for the church here. In, in verse 22 it says, He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church. We're going to see how this master plan helps the church. What God has in mind for the church. Because that's what the book of Ephesians is about. And, and in, in this first chapter here we're laying the foundation for what work God is doing. And so that will be all for today. Uh, thank you. And next week we will be talking. Uh, I'll be discussing Ephesians chapter two. That's it.